So now let's just get going, folks. Um, thank you, everyone, on the call for joining us today. Uh, we have um, a, a large crowd that's logged in from all parts of the world, I want to stress. While we have many parties from Europe, we also have parties joining us from China, from the US, from uh, ASEAN, and, and so on. And I guess this is testament to the global interest in the European taxonomy and the kind of work that we've been doing it over the last two years, Carl. Uh, I'm Sean Kidney. I'm the CEO of the Climate Bonds Initiative and a member of the European Union Technical Expert Group on Sustainable Finance that has produced, at the request of the European Commission, the EU taxonomy. This EU taxonomy will be become part of the European regulatory framework later this year. Member States, Parliament and the Commission have now agreed uh, on the basic framework and more recently at a European Council meeting on the regulatory aspects to it. We expect this to come into force as a voluntary regulation later this year. There will be an implementation period. By the end of 2022, this will be a mandatory disclosure regulation linked, or rather a, an aspect of the climate risk disclosure regulation that Europe is bringing in as part of its implementation of the task force of climate finance related disclosures uh, recommendations. Large investors, that is investors with more than 500 staff, corporations and banks, if the European Banking Authority completes its work by December on climate risk regulation, will be required to report to the market and to regulators on their climate exposure, their climate risk exposure, or how much uh, they've got that could be classed as brown, let's call it that. And they will also have the opportunity to report on their sustainable investments. They will want to support on their sustainable investments, they tell us, at the very minimum to balance out so they can show what they've got that's sustainable, to balance out what they've got uh, as brown, which are generally in Europe decreasing, but still there for diversification reasons and many reasons. So uh, we know that the appetite to disclose sustainability has already been proven thanks to the ESG market. And we see as a result of the taxonomy, many investors moving to use the taxonomy. We have 50 major asset managers working now to apply the taxonomy as it currently stands to their portfolios as part of uh, uh, getting used to it. We're expecting a two reporting cycle, two year implementation period before it comes mandatory. So the data provision can come into place. While companies like Refinitiv and Bloomberg and FTSE have already announced data initiatives to support the taxonomy, clearly investors and uh, banks are gonna to have to ask the corporations, their holdings for data to make this move. And that will take a little while to come in. So that's the background. It is tied to Europe's green stimulus. There has been much talk within the European Commission of the link between taxonomy, as we would call it at the, at the technical expert group, a procurement plan for the Paris Agreement, a framework for the future. We will see a link between green stimulus and taxonomy going forward. This taxonomy then becomes a very important tool. It's being used by many other countries now as guidance for what they should do. There's a key conceptual shift in this taxonomy compared to what we've been doing in the past. This is about absolute measures that are linked to how we interpret the IPCC 1.5 degree report of 2018, the IEA sub two degree modeling. We have been given a task by the commission to focus on climate change and climate adaptation resilience that is resolutely tied to the science. There are always political constraints implementation but what we've taken here is where we've got to get to, which is a net zero world in 2050, the formal and official European target, and a 50% cut in emissions by 2030, which is the target currently in the process of being finalised in Europe, where you expect the Commission and Member States to sign off on that in the near future, uh, based on the conversations we're having so far. We've used those as background information for our thinking in these particular areas. But we've said that there are investments that clearly qualify, but there are also transition investments. They're investments which we are related to how we can see a sector moving quickly towards achieving low emissions and, of course, adaptation and resilience. So in the steel industry, we've set a benchmark, an emissions-related benchmark for what would qualify as investments there. 
that will probably get tougher as we shift to zip net zero steel. In the building sector, we have a transition model, which will see a tightening of criteria till we get to net zero requirements for buildings in 2050 and so on. And we've got enabling investments, things like the manufacturing of components, um, wind turbines, triple glaze windows that we count as in because they are part of achieving the low carbon activities that are in the th headline thresholds. Today, we're going to look at waste and water. We are in the middle of a crisis. I need to acknowledge that. This is a COVID crisis, which we are now hearing from many climate scientists is tied to degradation of the environment. We know that pathogens jump between species when ecosystems are degraded or in crisis. Uh, we believe now that there is a correlation here. Now, that's not to say that this isn't a straightforward, simple pandemic health crisis we have to respond to. But if we start looking at the background reasons, we now begin to understand that the environmental situation we've got ourselves into is part of the reason this is happening. This is consistent with what the IPCC Health Committee and the World Health Organization have been telling us for 20 years we can expect from climate change. That is an increased number of pandemics, as well as other kinds of climate shocks. Flood, fire, much more intense storm activity, sea level rise, and the consequent consequences of those, which will be famines in some areas, uh, uh, certain terrains becoming impossible to live in, uh, potentially the deaths of millions of people from heat stress in India. All of these are examples of climate shocks we can expect to, it, to experience this century on even the best trajectories of emissions reduction. That is, we will now, we cannot avoid a century of climate shocks. What we're in a race to do is avoid catastrophic climate shocks. If we can reduce our emissions, 50% in 10 years, we have a reasonable chance of avoiding shocks so catastrophic that we may not be able to recover from them. I won't go into the detail now, it's a longer conversation, but that's our background thinking. It means that we have to think of resilience. So in this thinking of the crisis, we need to learn health system, social protections, what it means to create a resilient economy and society in the face of these shocks. When it comes to infrastructure, we already know about coastal resilience. Uh, and we will talk today a little bit about resilience in water systems. All of these are part of the agenda. I have a, a fantastic group today. First, my fellow technical expert group member and good friend, Carl Ludwig Brockman, who is, I have to say, has a very impressive title of Group Officer for Sustainability at KFW, the huge, vast German development bank, one of the biggest in the world, that does so much to drive green investments in Germany and in Europe, and internationally with its international program. Uh, the KFW has been involved in a number of aspects of the technical expert group's work. We have Mike Brown from the San Francisco Public Utilities Commission, who's the environment finance manager. He's been working on climate change issues with the San Francisco PUC for 14 years now, and is uh, been the, the genius behind their very successful green bond program. And then we have Terry Coleman from RWS Partners, who's a sustainability consultant, used to be at ERM, used to be at the Environment Agency, which is the UK's government agency, as a science manager, he has, as he put it, 20 years of working in waste to bring to the perspective today and an understanding of what are the real sustainability issues. We're gonna look at the taxonomy first. This is a bit conversational. We'll dive in and out as we go through, but I'm going to ask Carl to start us off on what we're doing here. Uh, there's a slide for those of you who can't see it uh, on the screen. All the slides will be available afterwards on our climatebonds.net webinars page, and, uh, which, and the URL flashed up at the end of this. You'll also be able to see the webinar on repeat on YouTube, and it'll become available as a podcast in the very near future. So if you can't see the slide, do not despair. They will be available to you afterwards. Carl, tell us what we're doing here. Yeah, I try to minimize desperation by uh, talking without uh, concrete reference to the slides and hope you will understand me. Um, in this way. Uh, can you hear me, Sean? It's, uh, Beautifully. It's okay. So, uh, you introduced me. Thank you very much for this. 
Um, the only thing I want to add is that I was uh, within the taxonomy group of the technical, the technical expert group. I was the chair for this sector we, we are talking about today for the sector of water, sewage and waste. And this meant to organize all the input from several experts from a public consultation and to manage it's something like management to manage to um, to to find a final representation of all the expert judgments of the criteria which we found would be central of the activities which were chosen so this was a management work and i tried to present the results to all of you here now thank you for listening so first of all uh, it, 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 should, it should be clear, we are talking about the climate mitigation contribution of this sector. We're not talking about the contribution to water or to circular economy, etc. It's the climate mitigation contribution. that We have to keep this in mind when we check, check the activities. The platform for sustainable finance to come from the end of the year on, uh, working from the end of the year on, will try to find criteria for the positive contribution of this sector to water protection, to circular economy, economy, et cetera. But here we are in the climate mitigation sphere. So um, the climate mitigation effect of this, this sector in the European Union is quite small. Only approximately 5% of all uh, greenhouse gas emissions in Europe come from, stem from this sector, but there are substantial indirect effects. So, and the, se the second thing I want to, I want to um, emphasize for the eight activities we found finally in this sector is that for most of them, the climate mitigation effect is, is the inherent result of the key char characteristics of the corresponding business model. I will try to explain this a little bit later. And there you can find three common features or underlying principles, how this sector contributes mainly indirectly to climate mitigation. The first one is safe energy and safe greenhouse gas emissions. And we will see this if we go into more detail uh, with the activity water collection, treatment and supply. Uh, this is about ensuring low energy consumption or ensuring substantial energy improvements. And the second activity, saving energy and greenhouse gas emissions is of course centralized wastewater treatment. Because we know that every centralized structure is by far more energy efficient than decentralized uh, structures of on-site sanitary uh, facilities. So this is this section, safe energy and greenhouse gas emissions. The second one is gain renewable energies from waste. And here we see three activities. This is anaerobic digestion of sewage sludge, second of bio waste and afterwards gaining um, landfill gas from landfills. So in here the, the context is capture and utilize the biogas, biogas from waste, uh, from sludge, from waste, from landfill material, and by this substitute fossil fuels and avoid methane emissions under, under, under otherwise uncontrolled um, circumstances. So this is the second section. And the other one, the third one, the last one is Take waste, every kind of waste, prepare it for, re for reuse or recycling in order, again, the in indirect effect, in order to substitute fossil-based material. Here we see composting of bio-waste, which means uh, composting of otherwise uh, left to the, to the soil bio-waste would substitute synthetic, synthetic fertilizers. Uh, and then we have the block separate collection and transport of non-hazardous waste. And afterwards, the next activity connected with this, with this one is material recovery from non-hazardous waste. Well, the logic is collect and transport waste in separate fractions, sort it and process it, and afterwards um, bring it into the market in order to substitute secondary raw materials, which would be produced by using fossil fuels. And this is the finally, in the end, the climate mitigation effect. So now, these are the three principles. We talked very briefly about, or I talked very briefly about uh, every of one of these eight activities we see here. There's a separate section on carbon capture. I, th I think, Sean, you will cover it uh, a little bit later in this presentation. Correct. That's right. And uh, so I could, what I can do now is the best uh, to go a little bit into detail, not too much. I, 
something to Carl, be before yep. we start, can I just ask our two colleagues on this? Great. How does this fit your perspective? I mean, uh, <clears throat> in terms of all the activities covered, uh, is there a lot that's not covered that we haven't been able to get to, or is it, is it a reasonably good collection of activities and, and uh, assets and so on relevant to achieving change? Just to give us a, a sense of an outside perspective, because Carl and I have been mired in this very inside the tent for two years now. Uh, perhaps Terry, we'll get you going first so we can hear those, that great voice. Can you hear me now? Beautifully. <clears throat> okay. Uh, yeah, I, I think it's it's a reasonable job that's being made here. Um, there's no doubt that it's a difficult process because we're always tempted to look when we're looking at waste management at, at the sort of consequential effects, particularly when we're talking about climate change. So we, we like to say, well, if we take this material out of the landfill and we recycle it, uh, we get the benefits from recycling and saving the raw materials, but we also get the benefits that might accrue from that material not being landfill and if it's biodegradable generating methane. Um, we uh, avoided that on the way through in terms of what climate bonds did and what's being done in the EU taxonomy. Uh, I think it, it's, a, it's a huge step on a journey. There's still part of the journey to go, uh, but it's a, it's a great start. Thank you. What I forgot to mention earlier is that Terry Coleman has also been the uh, lead consultant for the climate bonds work, which uh, preceded this uh, release of the EU taxonomy work, which is a companion piece, if you like, uh, although with a lot more focus on emerging markets. Um, Mike, from your perspective, Yes. Uh, hello, Sean and everyone. Um, well, at the, the in San Francisco Public Utilities Commission, we were responsible for water and wastewater treatment, as well as some public power, pro, uh, the public power provider. And um, based on the activities we were involved in, this does seem this does seem to cover them. Um, we, we aren't involved with waste, but we do on-site um, uh, biogas capture from our wastewater treatment plants and um, many of these activities just as well as composting okay so for reality check we're looking okay yes now, now th this is particularly relevant to you mike because i know you've been considering issuing green bonds in the european market and under the european green bond standard issuers in europe would need to align or rather uh, be aligned with the taxonomy and so this looks Perfectly doable from your perspective is my understanding. Is that right? Yeah, I mean, we're doing many of these things already. I do think that it's very helpful for US issuers to have uh, metrics to plan towards. So I think this is going to be very valuable. And I'll just say why uh, there is an opportunity, I think, for US municipal issuers uh, to market into Europe because a couple of years ago, the tax code changed that eliminated um, tax exempt a portion of the tax exempt refundings. So now when we do our refundings, many of them, not all, are sold on a taxable basis, which is um, uh, much more um, attractive to European or non-US investors because they wouldn't be able to take advantage of the tax exempt exemption. So um, there's an opportunity for us to sell into Europe. And so we've been actually looking at that quite closely. And uh, uh, I think that's a big opportunity for US uh, municipal issuers, especially of green bonds. Uh, and it's worth noting for people on the call that we have a pretty substantial green bond municipal market already in the US, led by the likes of San Francisco Public Utilities Corporation and New York Metropolitan Transit Authority. Uh, and so for all of you, great opportunity here, especially given the current interest rates which are available in Europe. But we won't go there, we'll go into the details. So Carl, back to you now. Take us um, through some of the detail here. Give us the highlights. Yes, uh, thank you. Uh, I saw a question on whether uh, hazardous waste uh, was an issue. I will try to answer this together uh, in, in, with, the, with this presentation in the next minutes. Right. So um, if, if we check the, the first activity, water collection, treatment and supply, then the idea is, uh, this is one of, this is in fact the only one where a concrete threshold is given. 
Um, the idea here is that uh, this is eligible as an environmental sustainable activity according to the taxonomy if the consumption per cubic meter of final water supply is, is very low, under 0 0.5 kilowatt hours per square meter, or uh, the other option is uh, you, 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 get it to, you get to improve your processes in a way that is mu much more efficient than before. The threshold here is 20% better, specific energy consumption, or uh, you're, you're, you are able to minimize the leakage in the, in the network by 20% or more. So this is the idea. After, if this is fulfilled, then the activity it can, it can be seen as eligible with the taxonomy together with the other criteria we are going to discuss later. These are only the so-called substantial contribution criteria. We have also do no significant harm and minimum safeguard. We can talk about this later. And uh, well, the other one is uh, the second one, the centralized wastewater treatment. Also very, gen very generic, as I said in my, uh, in, my, in my introduction, because we know if there's a centralized system and it substitutes other more intensive wastewater treatment systems like, like pit latrines or septic tanks, etc., we know there is a substantial greenhouse gas emission um, reduction from these mo much more efficient centralized structures. So this activity as such uh, is, uh, if, it is, if it can claim to substitute uh, other more less efficient uh, decentralized structures, then it is eligible. No threshold applies. Then we have a, a group of activities which are based on anaerobic digestion uh, of sewage sludge in wastewater treatment plants, of bio waste, and also the gas capture from landfill, from existing landfill. And here the idea is, of course, um, so we, we, we produce biogas uh, to, to, to uh, deliver to, to some uh, utility or to uh, use it by itself in the, in the, in the, in the uh, treatment plan, for example, for generation of electricity or heat or for biomethane uh, injection into the gas grid, etc., etc., under the condition that uh, there is some control of the methane, le methane leakage, which is a very prominent issue because with, with a very small methane leakage, you can also, you can destroy all the positive uh, greenhouse gas effect you have from the gas capture. So this is, this is very similar for three of, of the eight activities. And then we have the block uh, separate collection and transport of non-hazardous waste in source segregated fractions. This is the correct name. So collect, in, in segregated waste, transport it, and then the, the, the connected to this is activity number seven, is sort it and prepare it and then sell it for to being reused or recycled uh, as, as for to being used uh, in some processes uh, in order to substitute uh, original virgin material from fossil, from mainly from fossil fuel. So this is the idea here again. Also here, this is a good example. The, 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 the activity itself, the, the business model, is the contribution for, to climate mitigation because waste which would otherwise uh, simply uh, uh, be untreated and in the long run would, uh, would somehow emit uh, greenhouse gas emissions is used to uh, substitute fossil fuels. This is a very, very, also very important and substantive climate mitigation effect. So, so and here, Carl, and, Carl, and here comes the question: Why no yeah. hazardous waste? So yeah. here, and then I come to you, uh, Sean, again. Yeah. Um, the, the question is: uh, Why didn't we consider hazardous waste? Well, the, the, this is very simple, because the climate mitigation effect of recycling hazardous waste is very, very small. It will be an issue for the platform to discuss when it comes to water protection, to pollution prevention, to circular economy, etc. But the climate mitigation effect by recycling hazardous waste, substituting primary fossil fuel based other material would be very small and was not subs yeah, considering the, the, the scarce resources of the tech and of the experts was uh, yeah, we reprioritized to the platform. It's interesting to note that you, don't, in many of these areas, you don't have a threshold. It's very simple, folks. 
If you meet yeah. the description, you're in. You don't need to do deep analysis to justify the investments if you meet the description. And this is an example of how we're trying to simplify the criteria for the industry to reduce their attraction costs and to make it clear to all sorts of actors simply what's in, what's out. Uh, so there's a few places where that occurs. Mike, you've actually got some investments in this area, don't you? You, you at SPUC, um, this is a key part of your work. Can you yeah, I mean, of, is this viable? Is this, is there, are, there, are there any uh, complications in this from your perspective? No, I mean, I, th I think that these activities are, you know, it, gives, it, it seems to give, uh, uh, you know, utilities like us um, a lot of flexibility in, in, in selecting projects and technologies, and I think, I think that makes sense. Um, I mean, something we're trying to do is um, align all of our capital investments with our stated climate goals and policies. So we have adapt specific adaptation uh, requirements and also mitigation requirements like the EU to be carbon neutral by 2050. So uh, we, we're, we're now in the process of, of looking at different tools to load our projects into a model to project out to see if we're on the one and a half degree or two degree trajectory and, on a project by project level. So you have these uh, kind of rolling up into these activities like wastewater treatment or collection, but uh, we're curious to know on a project level are we are we on track or not? So I think I think that they'll both uh, probably be needed. I mean, I, it sounds though that um, I think this is a like a terrific start and um, um, will be like I said earlier a great value to um, um, to utilities like us to have a framework to, to plan around. Thanks, uh, Carl. Maybe maybe to add something to this, of course. Uh, our our vision, vision was that anaerobic digestion of otherwise unused used sludge would have a climate mitigation effect per se. Of of, this is fine, but of course the process of making biogas from CO sludge can be improved more and more. There's still other potential to to have uh, the, the the electrical facilities uh, more efficient, the pumps. Uh, I don't know what, what, what else. So there is still another layer of possibilities within all these activities which we did not address explicitly, which also offer potential for climate mitigation, of course. Terry, uh, I, I'm, I'm conscious that there's a separate waste to energy criteria and there we have recommended the commission explore it further. We haven't bought in at this stage. It's been a controversial issue in Europe. Um, of course, the climate bonds has come out with a criteria which says no waste to energy in Europe, but waste to energy in other markets, especially emerging markets, has a transition role. But of course, anaerobic digestion using a biogas is a kind of waste to energy, but a little bit of a carve out in this area. So, Terry, any thoughts or reflections on this, this part and how it links to the, the broader issues you've been looking at? Yeah, thanks, Sean. Uh, th yeah, there's been a couple of questions online really related to waste to energy and, uh, and why it doesn't appear. Um, I, I think it's a difficult issue because it always gets wrapped up in the politics. Um, undoubtedly, it is possible to size energy from waste plant or waste to energy plant and contract them so that it, it can detract from higher levels of recycling. Um, but we, we addressed this differently uh, when we were working on the climate bonds criteria and we really said, well, what are we looking at here? What we want is a level playing field. If you can deliver the benefits of climate change mitigation with waste to energy without detracting from other benefits from things like recycling, then that's what we want to do. And, and we looked at uh, several things. One was increasing the efficiency, and that's principally through uh, the application of combined heat and power or cooling and power, uh, which of course decreases the carbon intensity of the, of the power produced. Um, another was to reduce the fossil intake to uh, energy from waste plants. 
and that's that's quite key really if you if you can't reduce the fossil intake then you're never going to get down to the the sorts of levels that we need to uh, in the the tens of grams per um, kilowatt hour of electricity produced in order to make a, a decent contribution towards climate change mitigation but if you do these things uh, and if you incorporate it into some form of plan that ensures you're achieving high levels of recycling and getting the benefits from that in climate change terms then it, it has to be a benefit and it's a particular benefit if the alternative is landfill um, and you're and you're sending biodegradable waste to landfill because however good your collection system is you're still only going to pick up just over half the methane and, and methane as we all know has got a global warming potential which is 28 times that of carbon dioxide so it, it is a challenging area uh, for those of you that aren't familiar with waste to energy one of the big issues with uh, waste to energy plants is that often the high carbon material is needed in it to provide the heat intensity and that often means plastics and you will you find a situation where waste to energy can reduce the interest in people recycling plastic so you get a collateral problem apart from the fact that one of the key circular economy provisions in terms of european policy is to recycle rather than burn but it is it's a challenging issue in doing this and there are some circumstances where clearly this requires further investigation so just to be clear for everyone waste to energy is not currently excluded in the taxonomy because people have been writing that but equally it's not currently included it's in the same uh, category as nuclear it requires further investigation before determination can be made and at the new sustainable platform which is a unit within the european commission that will pick up our work and keep working on it will be charged with doing these investigations in a manner where science opinions can be drawn in from all quarters just to be clear let's move on now to the next section carl uh, on this page with the anaerobic digestion and composting yes thank you well uh, as i said this is one of of, of uh, three similar activities so anaerobic digestion of huge sludge in this case later on on bio waste and landfill landfill material so as i said the it's very important to, to control the methane leakage. It's, uh, because small, as I said, some very small leakages can already uh, counter uh, the, the positive effects of, of the whole exercise. So this is uh, maybe a word on, on the word is controlled by a monitoring plan. This sounds a little bit soft, but what is behind a plan, of course, uh, includes some 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 control, some reporting. So a plan here should be read as a very broad concept in order to control methane leakage and a plan to be implemented and not only being paper, of course. And here, um, in the end, there's, this was, by the way, a result of the, of the public consultation that we opened very largely the, the, the possible usages of the biogas, which can not only be electricity or heat, but also biomethane to be introduced into the gas, or as a vehicle fuel, or even as a feedstock in the chemical industry. This is one of, of the examples where we, uh, where we change the criteria after the public uh, feedback. And so th this is a very straightforward concept which we can also find in, for the activities as i said number five on bio waste and neuro digestion bio waste and number eight landfill gas capture so and then uh, again some some uh, details on on separate collection transport of non-hazardous waste and source segregated fractions so here um um i'm on the wrong uh, I was, so this was bio waste. Sorry for 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 um, I missed I missed this. I didn't talk about fuel such but anaerobic digestion or bio waste. And now come coming to composting. Uh, this is um, very very simple. Also, um, again, the, the the business concept itself is, itself is the climate mitigation contribution. So it means the bio waste should be uh, segregated, collected, and 
uh, afterwards it should be used to produce fertilizer. And in the end of this argumentation, substituting synthetic, synthetic uh, fertilizers on, based on fossil fuels. And one important condition is here, and this is the only place where we feel something like, uh, like analyzing the, the waste hierarchy. The only th we have to check whether anaerobic digestion of bio-waste, which I introduced uh, some minutes before, is not a technically and economically viable alternative. Because if this is not feasible, then composting is an eligible uh, green taxonomy according to, the, to, to, the, uh, to our report. So this is on bio-waste. Maybe we can, yeah. I'll keep, I'll keep moving in. I, I will note that there is someone, in it, a biochar expert on the call who is, and I'm recommending to have a closer look at the criteria, uh, but it, did you have a discussion about biochar and pyrolysis in this context, Car, Was that part of the, um, the representations that were made? Sorry, once, once again, the question, I missed it. Uh, biochar and pyrolysis. We're being asked, how does that fit with the criteria we have now in terms of use, use, using waste material? Oh, I don't, I don't think so. I, I can't remember at the moment. Okay. would have to check it. It's okay. We'll have a look at that. I mean, at, and Terry, I might ask you in a minute too, but let's just um, finish off these sections. Material recovery from non-hazardous -hazard waste. Reasonably yes. straightforward, right? That's, that's connected to the other activity, as I said. Uh, here we have one caveat, which means uh, because uh, um, this, this, it should be waste which is uh, transformed into secondary raw material and, and not uh, any, any energy crops, et cetera. So we said 50% at, at, at least, um, uh, no, no, this is, sorry. Oh, I've, I've, sorry, I've got the wrong one. We are now, I have a problem with my handy. Ah, uh, sorry, we're at number seven, material recovery from non Oh, we are number seven, but sorry, sorry, that's the wrong one. For, so, for, every, for uh, everyone, just to explain, Carl's had to come in on his mobile phone, so he's juggling two devices and not fully in sync. Please go ahead, yes. Carl. Yes, I have to switch my view. Audio is, um, you need to turn the audio back on. You're on mute. That's it. Okay, all the technical disturbances are finished, hopefully. So number <laughs> seven, also in the technical report, number seven, Material recovery from non-hazardous waste, of, okay. So we have the, the non-hazardous waste, which was collected and transported to this facility. And so here, the, 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 the objective is to sort it. And of course, uh, the, the material you find will not always have the necessary quality. And so the criteria here is uh, that at least 50% by weight, by waste, of the collected non-hazardous waste is converted into secondary raw materials. This is, yeah, has some ambitions, as, as the expert said, but it's not exaggerating. So to, to really gain 50% by weight from the waste to be transformed into secondary raw materials is, uh, so to say, a quality measure which is introduced here, to have some quality in the process. And so the last one, landfill gas capture and utilization, was not uh, such an easy um, activity because uh, <laughs> some alarm signs uh, uh, um, opened in the, in, the, in the brains of several people. But uh, the, the context here is this shall not and should not be an incentive uh, to open new uh, landfills uh, in order to, to make money with the gas capture. So the, the restriction is the landfill may not be opened after uh, December this year when the taxonomy regulation is, enters into force. So it's only for already given landfill um, facilities and it will be permanently closed and it's not taking further waste. So we don't want to support uh, active landfills. And of course, uh, from which we, the features we know from the other activities, the gas gained from the landfill is used for electricity or heat production uh, to be fed into the grid or as vehicle fuel, etc., feedstock in the chemical industry. And again, the same thing as for the others, please control methane emissions by a monitoring plan. And again, it's the activity itself which uh, offers 
this very substantial climate mitigation effect. And so the consequence is no threshold applies. Terry, any comments on this difficult area of landfill gas and capture from your perspective? Uh, no, I, I think the only thing I would say when we were looking at this, it was the, the percent recovery of landfill gas which made the difference in terms of the climate change uh, impacts from landfill. Uh, there, were, there were reasonable figures around on how much methane and carbon dioxide is generated from, uh, from biodegradable waste in landfills. What there, there aren't is very definitive figures on how much is collected, but we can make some reasonable uh, reasonable estimates from the science that has been done and unfortunately um, we're in a position where we're collecting uh, say between 50 and 60 percent of it and if you're emitting between 40 and 50 percent as a methane then you you have a, a very high um, climate change impact per tonne of waste or per tonne of biodegradable waste that's going into a landfill so yeah, I, I think these controls uh, ensuring effectively that it's only from closed sites and people aren't using it to make money uh, are great. Uh, we don't want people investing in, uh, in new landfills unnecessarily and certainly not at the expense of recycling. I think that's the key issue, isn't it? I mean, in Mike, in San Francisco, San Francisco as a city is way advanced on issues of recycling. From your perspective, can you give us a flavour of the sort of message and of sort of things that are forward-looking cities doing in relation to removing landfill entirely and so on? Yeah, I I, I know that um, well for organic materials, there's a very extensive composting program, municipal composting program. So everything is collected. I think we're over 90% uh, diversion uh, into the waste stream of organic waste. And then for recyclables, I know there's a there's um, an effort to uh, reduce the waste uh, upstream, so so to um, reduce plastics overall, so it doesn't even end up in the recycling um, uh, system. So there there is a big uh, big effort underway in those in those areas. Yes, uh, maybe, maybe I can add to this. Mm -hmm. First, uh, first this issue of methane leakage. Um, I, I remember some discussion about giving a threshold how many. Uh, how many landfill gas should be captured, etc. Finally, we decided to say there has to be a, a good monitoring plan in order to control methane leakages. And well, it's also in the interest of the of the owner of this facility to gain as much methane he can he can in order to to raise his profits. So we thought this this would be enough at this stage. And the other thing, as you mentioned, um, plastic um, plastic waste. Of course, this is, so to say, a weakness of, of the, of the uh, activity-based approach of the taxonomy. We cannot that much consider interlinkages between different activities. They, are, they have to work standalone. So um, if there's a facility who wants to apply to be eligible according to the taxonomy, it somehow has to be ring-fenced from the circumstances around. So the activity itself has to comply. And uh, so uh, this is uh, this is on, this is only a comment, a, a weakness which uh, in a, in a standalone activity-based methodology cannot solve in the end by 100%. And so it's very good that uh, companies like yours uh, try to follow the waste hierarchy and avoid as much as waste uh, right from the beginning. So you can see that there's further work for us to do as we test out these criteria in practical settings and as we start thinking about further ways that we can elaborate criteria and experiment of ideas of how we might package up things to address the problem that Carl raises. But we've got to get going, we've got to get started, that's what we've done now. Our view is we've got 80%, maybe 85% of the way there, there's still another 15% of work to be done to get there and that will be the subject of work in the coming years, which means if you've got reflections on the practicability or on areas that we haven't been able to cover at this stage, there is scope to make 
presentations to the sustainable platform that will start operating a little later this year and to the technical expert group until then, and we'll feed them into that process. They won't come through in the current iteration of regulation, which is pretty well baked, but they will be as part of next year's work. So bear that in mind. I, I want to shift to just covering quickly the carbon capture and sequestrations, but any reflections, Mike, about from your perspective? I, I'm curious to know some of the things that you're in your green bonds already, which you've been funding, and how they relate to what's in this particular taxonomy. Um, a lot, well, a lot of the, the, the capital investments we make now are, uh, uh, do meet cl our climate uh, goals uh, as, a, as a state and as a municipality to be carbon neutral by 2050, as I mentioned. Um, we also have a lot of social inclusion goals uh, um, so that there's jobs created and investment in education and things like that. So we're doing also a lot of that, which I noticed is, is not directly in here, but I, but probably in, in, a, in an associated way is, um, um, yeah. And I, I'm going to come to adaptation resilience in a minute because at this stage, we pick those up and do no significant harm provisions. So let me come back to that. Uh, Cherry, anything you want to throw in at this stage before I cut to CCS for a minute? Uh, no, I'm fine, thanks, Sean. Okay, so we've also said, and this is waste capture, but this work was done in, uh, in relation to electricity generation and manufacturing sectors, where we see prospect for uh, carbon capture and sequestration. There are four areas that we've identified here. The first thing is direct air capture. Not a lot of that happening now. We cannot meet our emission reduction goals unless we scale up direct air capture. And that doesn't necessarily mean from electricity or from manufacturing, it means straight out of the CO2 in the atmosphere and potentially other GHGs, but CO2 as the focus. There are many very interesting technologies and startups. There's a field in England where there's a whole direct air capture uh, installation that's been in trials for the last few years, just slowly turning away, sucking carbon out of the atmosphere and converting it into useful byproducts. Now, the question is, can we scale that up and other uh, programs like that into financially viable measures to make them be adopted quickly? Even if we don't, we are going to have to do this as a subsidy program if that doesn't happen. There is no way we reach our targets. We've got so much carbon in the atmosphere already that we have to do everything possible. Reduce what we've got, take what we can out of the atmosphere, etc. So we put it in, it's very simple. If you are capturing CO2 out of the atmosphere, it's in. Now, there may be issues about the utilization of the, of the byproducts. That'll be dealt with in other areas and in other sectors like chemicals or CCS down below, perhaps. So in the carbon capture uh, and sequestration program, which some of you have heard about, again, under all the models we've seen, there doesn't seem to be any way to achieve our targets without some element of carbon capture and sequestration. This can be controversial. There are some forms of CCS, as it's commonly called, which, can, uh, which seem to increase risk of earthquakes and so on, at least in some people's eyes, a bit like the shale gas controversies that we've seen. However, it's important to note there are many different kinds of sequestration available. Uh, there's a plant in uh, Norway, which has been operating for 20 years in pilot now, offshore, which seems to be operating very stably. Uh, Reykjavik Energy in Iceland has been capturing emissions from the geothermal plants, injecting that into what they call young basalt, aerated basalt, and it mineralizes within six to 24 months. That is, it turns to rock. Now, that is a very stable form of sequestration. So there are many different kinds of solutions coming through here. We try to provide some thresholds, very simple. If you're capturing it, then you have to show that the activity that's used to cap rate operates under the threshold. For example, if you've got a CO2 plant attached to an electricity plant, a combined gas cycle, for example, the combined gas cycle is only relevant if it's below 100 gram threshold, which is our electricity generation threshold, but the actual installation next to it can still be included. In the transport of CO2, which is essentially pipelines, but it could be ships, and so on, we've got a leakage factor, which is a prime, primary issue 
we're trying to address. So we need to make sure we don't leak. Otherwise, what's the point in doing this? And then we have excluded CCU, which is essentially the carbon capture and utilization of uh, CO2 products. Now, that's not necessarily a long time exclusion. For the moment, we've excluded because there are real challenges in ensuring that the material that is then utilized actually maintains its sequestration value and isn't released again to the atmosphere. And it's a heterogeneous area, lots of different ways of usage, muy complicado. So we haven't included that at this stage. That may be up for discussion under the sustainable platform. Look, they're the key things. Um, if there, there are, of course, if national standards organizations, standards you've got to use for the sequestration, to address some of the concerns that are around. There are clearly rules, but the key point is, we don't think we can do it without it. We don't necessarily think this is gonna be particularly valuable in the electricity sector. I have to say, that's my opinion. That's not a technical expert group pronunciation here. And that's because we have so many other options in the electricity sector. And we've got to deal with the challenge, particularly of the life cycle emissions of gas from wellhead to pipeline. And we're way, 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 away from making that uh, problem that's gone away yet. So it's gonna take time, but in manufacturing, we're really gonna need this. And that might mean steel initially, it'll certainly mean cement production and so on. So that's it. I wanna take you to do no significant harm provisions as the next, to give you a flavor of the detail. And uh, the first one I mentioned is the last of this list, which is we are expecting people to have identified and to reduce material, physical, climate risk in whatever installations they are building or managing in their previous pages. I'm going to ask Mike for an example of this now because I know you've been doing this and addressing this in San Francisco. Tell us a bit about what it actually looks like when you address the adaptation and resilience issues in your water and, and wastewater infrastructure. Uh, so in, in San Francisco, we, we plan around uh, sea level rise for in-city projects. So all of the capital investments that the, that the city makes, that's about $4 billion a year, must uh, uh, be uh, built around projected sea level rise. And if, if that's not possible, then there has to be a plan on how to uh, adapt to that um, should, should there be um, flooding. And then on a, a mitigation standpoint, um, all of our projects, again, uh, are screened for emissions and also impact on the environment. We do an environmental impact on all of our projects. Um, it's actually required by state law, CEQA it's called. And so we are doing this now. And then in our reporting, we're including all of this information, links to the, the environmental impact reports. Uh, this is on our green bond reporting, links to our, the environmental impact reports. Also alignment with the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals because there are a lot of um, uh, co-benefits associated with the projects uh, that are being built. And um, and then that's in addition to just direct environmental benefits. So this is not complicated. And this just needs to be ordinary business for everyone from now, Mike, right? Yes, what? yeah, absolutely, oh. yeah. And I think um, um, just from a, from a bond issuance standpoint, which is sort of my vantage point, I think, um, it's, a, it's, a, it's very helpful when talking to investors to be able to describe everything we're doing. And I think it gives investors confidence that the, the bond issuer is going to be, um, uh, going, to be uh, going to have a stable long-term business because they're, they're planning around these risks. Um, uh, absolutely right. So you have to do an adaptation. We do require people to do environmental impact assessments. Now, clearly that's governed by law in many countries. There are, of course, some countries where that's not governed by law. So if you come from one of those countries and you want to be issued in the European market for a green bond, you will need to show that you've done an EIA or equivalent anyway. There are some, you know, look, this is all, if you do one thing that's good, you can't be doing bad at the same time. That's the principle behind this. You know, a solar farm in a wetland, not a good idea. And so th what we've done here is tease out some, some key issues in sewage, for example, you need to implement measures to avoid the overflow that happens in, uh, what, that used to happen in Washington, D.C. And Washington, D.C. water has invested a huge amount over the last 10 years to avoid that problem. It still happens in London at times and happens in many cities around the world. These, 
Now, because we're going to get much bigger rainfall dumps in the future, we're going to see more overflows unless we do the infrastructure investment now to address that. It should be a filter on all investments here. Um, we talked about with uh, needing to use best available techniques for anaerobic treatment of waste. Uh, we want for trucks, if you're going to use waste collection, we want you to use at least a minimum standard of efficiency. This is not a particularly tough standard, Euro V. Carl, can you give it a flavor? What does this mean for a truck? What's Euro V standard here? Yes. Yes, it's it's a modern standard. Um, there were some in, in the public uh, consultation. There was uh, some uh, some voices who said mm -hmm. it should be even more stringent than Euro five. Others said, "Oh, it could be less, like three or four. So we're somewhere in between in between on a reasonable and modern, uh, close to best available technology level. I would say in this case. Now these are these can be trucks that are powered. Uh, possibly by diesel, but certainly by gas and so on, will qualify in this. Our, uh, this is likely to be reviewed as more alternatives become available in the fleet in future. But for the moment, it's a fairly generous standard, I, I think yeah. we would argue, Carl, right? Yes, and we would, we would have to keep in mind that the positive climate mitigation uh, contribution of waste collection is much, much more than the emissions we can expect from the trucks. So there's something like uh, the materiality is uh, on the other side. The, the, in the end, in the, on balance, the emissions from the trucks are not that material. Indeed. So now uh, there may be some questions. Do any of you want to add anything to do no civil harm? Or can I throw a left field question at you? Diesel. How does a desalination plant fit under this card at the moment? We have them being built in uh, all around the world at the moment, obviously in the UAE and places like that, but also in, in California. How would we treat that? Are you asking me? I'm asking you and Mike, because I know, Mike, you've been looking at this too. But that's Mike, start yeah. us off. Well, I think I think with desal, a lot of it depends on what the energy source is going to be, because obviously it's a very energy intensive process. Absolutely. And yeah. So, and then there's the issue of the the environmental impact of the byproduct. But I think if we can get the um, the energy source squared away, um, so it's a, a, a GHG free source, then the, um, uh, that looks like a viable option um, for us. Uh, that is something that's that's being looked at quite closely, along with other alternative. Uh, water supplies because there's a lot of demand on our on our water source. And in fact, there was a green sukuk, an Islamic bond, for a desal plant in the United Arab Emirates that was issued late last year, which was certified by the Climate Bonds Initiative under its water criteria, that was tied to a large installation of solar to power it, as a good example of what you're saying. And yeah. our understanding is this would qualify under the way we frame the taxonomy, the criteria at this stage. So, uh, so, Sean, I would like to. I, I think a desalination plant uh, would not be covered by any activity which we can see or to come from the water waste sector because it's. I, I guess it's not that much a water issue, at, as my colleague said, uh, but it's more an energy issue. And so it's, it's something about the energy group to think about, and uh, or the industry group. I think in the end. But if we would see something like this, desalination green, according to the taxonomy, I'm quite sure there will be a do no significant harm criterion on the water side. We, we're in the wrap up stage, guys, because we're, we start a bit late, gone a bit over. Terry, any reflections from you about what's in here and notably your thoughts on things that the sustainable platform can now pick up to further develop this taxonomy. Yeah, thanks, Sean. Um, I, I think the, the key area is going to be finding some way to, to fit energy from waste into this taxonomy or out of it. Uh, I don't think the position that it's in at the moment can go on. Uh, there's too much investment that goes into energy from waste plants, particularly in the uh, world that's moving from developing stage to developed. Uh, but I think we need to make sure that they don't make the same mistakes that we perhaps made. 
and get over capacity in some countries. So, yeah, there's a there's a good deal of work to do on that. Uh, I would like to be able to introduce these advanced thermal treatments as well. Uh, so the biochar that we've heard about, mm -hmm. um, it all sounds it all sounds good. Um, my problem has always been that it it's it's very difficult uh, to handle different feedstocks the more complicated the process that you get. And so if you have a very heterogeneous feedstock uh, like municipal waste, then that's a, a very good Mike, final reflections and the future. Thanks. Um, I, I'm, I think this is terrific. I'm, I, I think I think utilities like ours and, and bond issuers like like our like us uh, uh, this is this provides us a framework to plan around to plan our we, we in San Francisco have sort of um, got a start on this already but this I think this really helps us um, get our arms around uh, what's going to be expected and what the future is going to look like and of course as you said it's going to be uh, continue to be refined and um, I, I, th I think this is uh, very good and I hope that um, uh, gets widely adopted in the U.S. I, I think that as a bond issuer looking at hopefully issuing in Europe, um, I think this is a very helpful. Carl, I'll pick up the detail question for you afterwards because I think we should probably put that in our FAQs, right? A, a, just a response given there's been a couple of questions about it. But your thoughts now, um, uh, you've been buried in this for a long time. Uh, it's out there. Uh, are you getting positive feedback and what are you thinking What's your thinking about future development in the context of the things you weren't able to wrap up in the time frame you had available to you? Where do you see this going? Well, it was a pleasure. And uh, I know from, from other colleagues from the tech, we missed the monthly meetings. And uh, <laughs> the, web, the web meeting is not a real substitute for this. Well, um, I, I, I see a lot of people and institutions approaching Doris Kramer, which also worked in the Green Bond subgroup, and me asking several questions and we now have to think about how to organize all these things in order to bundle the information we should place uh, we, should, we should give from from our side but uh, well i'm very curious about how the, the commission will um, will will yeah will, what what it will write into its delegated act will we see more about more guidance about how to exactly implement the, the taxonomy, how to show eligibility and control eligibility with the criteria. Will there be some guidance from the Commission or will there be some guidance from the European Banking Association, which afterwards will have to give some uh, regulatory technical standards for this and for the reporting requirements we see? And so, and this is urgently needed because most of the questions are uh, so there are two, maybe two types. What exactly do you mean by this? criteria and how to measure, etc. And the second one is uh, about the process, how to show eligibility, how to uh, check eligibility, etc. So these are the two complexes which really need uh, more, uh, more reflection and uh, more, uh, more guidance. Thank you. I, I appreciate a lot of questions online. My apologies for not being able to deal with them all. We will be publishing a frequently asked questions as a result of collecting all of these questions and then figuring out how to respond to them in a structured fashion. Uh, we'll make that available again in future. If you're listening into future webinars, well, first, every Thursday, 1500 Paris time and Frankfurt time to be, to be precise for Carl, another webinar will be happening around the taxonomy and related issues for at least the next five weeks. Please do look up our website about it, which is listed on the page in front of you, climatebonds.net slash webinars. The download of the full report is on the screen for those you've got it now, will be available in the PowerPoint afterwards. But if you search EU Technical Expert Group Taxonomy, you will find it. It is available freely on the European Commission websites and there are, there's a user guide as well as a detailed technical annex. Um, thank you for having joined us on this, uh, I think, really interesting webinar. Thanks. Uh, Mike, especially for having get up, gotten up at a so mm. such an early hour in San Francisco, for Carl, for the work you've done for the last couple of years steering this through, for Terry, the work you've done for Climate Bonds and steering our work through and the comments you made today. Thank you, everyone, for your interest in sustainable finance and, frankly, let's face it, interest in creating a future for our kids going forward.
because that's what we're doing here. That's what we're doing. We're charting a course for a world which will be low carbon and climate resilient, which is the world that this crisis shows us we need to sort out of urgency. Tempo, tempo, tempo. We have 10 years to get emissions down 50% or frankly, we're toast. That's what it is. And this is an important mm. part of doing it. We now have a global conversation on what's in, what's out, boundaries, which is way overdue, which this is circling around the taxonomy. It's not, that's why we're having this. There's lots and lots of detail about this. The main point is, is to argue the point and push for ambition, 50% reduction in 10 years. Thank you, everyone. See you on the next webinar. And thanks to our speakers.